Mr. Chair, it is just 9.30 now and my colleague is starting the live stream. If we could just give it about 20 seconds uh, for it to get up and running. And if we could ask uh, perhaps Mr. Mitchell, if he is there, if he could uh, turn his camera on, we should have quorum and we should be able to begin. Mr. Chair, we are ready when you are. Okay, thank you very much and welcome. I have uh, apologies from Councillor Oosterhoff and I'm just looking, I believe that we are missing Councillor Doherty and Jennifer Demeter. But we have a quorum, so I will call the meeting to order. Uh, you have an agenda, you have an addendum to the agenda. Um, the only um, comment I would make, uh, Madam Clerk, is that on page four of the agenda, I believe we have a typing mistake, which I might as well correct now. Um, it's in the uh, item on 124 Center. And in the middle of the page, you see that the approval of the, and I think that word should be alterations rather than removal. Sorry, Mr. Chair, it was number four of the conditions. This, no, this is Sorry. page page four of the agenda. Um, so the beginning of the line between the recommendations and the conditions starts off with the word that, that the approval of the, and I believe it should say of the alterations be subject. That's our okay. standard wording. wording. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will take note of that and perhaps um, when we get to the business item, we can have the planner speak to it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you have an addendum as, I, as uh, we mentioned that was mailed out to you. Is there any other changes to the agenda? And seeing none, I look for a mover for the approval of the agenda as printed. Uh, Jennifer, and seconded by Moya, thank you. Further discussion? Jane's just reaching for her light, okay. <laughs> uh, seeing no further discussion, those in favor of the agenda as printed, those opposed, you have an agenda. The minutes of February the 17th, you had sent to you. Um, do we have... Uh, any changes, any alterations need to be made to them? So I'm looking for a mover and a seconder for the confirmation of the minutes of February the 17th. Moving by Paul Banfield, thank you. Seconder, Jennifer, thank you. Further discussion, corrections. Okay, seeing none, those in favor? Those opposed, you have a set of minutes. Pecuniary interest, I have heard of none. Uh, does anybody at this point need to declare a pecuniary interest? And welcome, Councillor Togarty. And uh, I would make my usual comment then that if you realize during the meeting that um, things have changed, then uh, you will need to uh, state loudly and quickly what is happening. Item five, presentations. I don't believe we have any. The clerk is muted so I can rush through these. Delegations, briefings, business, cultural heritage, third crossing naming campaign. Jennifer, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you and through you we just wanted to offer a very quick update to the committee today about the third crossing naming campaign which has officially launched. 
Uh, I think the committee may be familiar with the council has approved to name the third crossing in a way that recognizes and honors indigenous history and culture in this region. So I just wanted to draw the committee's awareness to this naming campaign um, getting underway. And if the committee is interested in more information about this project and the process that's going to unfold over the course of the next 10 months, uh, you can find that information on the Third Crossing website. We're beginning with Indigenous input and discussions, which will conclude at the end of May. And then there will be an open public consultation period, which will run over the course of the summer. Thank you. Good, thank you. Questions to Dr. Campbell? And seeing none, the Sir John A. Macdonald History and Legacy Working Group. Is that you as well? It is thank indeed, you. and thank you and through you. Um, also, just a verbal update to the committee so that you're aware. The Sir John A. Macdonald History and Legacy Working Group that was approved by Council in October of 2020 had its first meeting at the beginning of March. It is a working group, and these meetings are shared on the um, public events calendar of the City of Kingston website. Uh, members of the public are invited to attend if they're interested in listening to what's being discussed. And there's also a period in every meeting that we're reserving for public input at the conclusion of those meetings. Moving forward, we expect the meetings to be in the first week of every month in a routine way. We're targeting a Wednesday right now. Um, but again, if you're interested in following uh, that work, you can look to the events calendar for more information about upcoming meetings. Um, and as well, we will be sharing the notes that come out of these meetings. Uh, although I just wanted to, to um, comment on that because our notes will track one month behind the previous meet minutes, uh, sorry, the previous meeting due to the need to confirm the, the notes with the working group members and then publish it uh, thereafter. That's all, thank you. Good, thank you very much. And thank you for including us in those minutes. Any questions uh, to Dr. Campbell on that? group, the legacy working group. Seeing none again then, we'll move on to policy development and implementation to heritage assets, the Pump House Museum and the McLaughlin to statutory business, 18 Barry Street. Alex, I think that's you, yep, welcome. Good morning, good morning Heritage Kingston morning. members. <laughs> So we have an application for alteration under Section 33 of the Ontario Heritage Act for 18 Berry Street. This property is a Part 4 designation. Next slide, please. So the subject property is located at 18 Berry Street. So that's on the northwest corner of Berry Street and King Street West. Next slide, please. The property contains Macklem House, which is a two-story classical revival style residence constructed in 1830 by Thomas Rogers with the portico addition constructed in 1905. Next slide, please. So again, this property is designated under part four of the act. Um, it was designated in 1975. And this house is a very interesting um, and somewhat eclectic example of the classical revival style. Volume two of buildings of architectural and historical significance um, includes quite a bit of uh, information that is in the updated, uh, was in the updated um, part four designation bylaw. Uh, it was designated first in 1975 and then updated in 1976 to expand those reasons. This quote sort of helps um, give a little bit of a sense of its importance as a sort of corner anchor building at this intersection. So. This house commands attention as it is on a prominent corner overlooking two areas of McDonald Park. Its overall physical size and scale of ornament justify its function as a pivotal point in this landscape area. The original house facing King Street and built by Thomas Rogers in 1830 is disguised under later remodeling and 1905 edition of the portico by the Birmingham family. So in terms of the heritage attributes that we'd be looking at in this application that are, that are relevant, certainly it's the classical revival portico that was constructed in 1905 on the Berry Street frontage. Um, there's the wraparound uh, veranda on the south elevation and an ionic porch on the north elevation. Next slide, please. So essentially, um, this is a, a plan diagram that was uh, included as supporting information. And I'm just gonna start by uh, speaking to the main, main alterations that are proposed in this, in this application. So staff, visited the site uh, in early February. The porches and entrance stairs on all four elevations appeared to require varying levels of repair and repainting. Um, looking at standard three of Parks Canada's standards and guidelines, which calls for conserving heritage value by adopting an approach calling for minimal intervention. 
The supporting information that was included in this application certainly demonstrates this approach. It proposes a range of treatments that correspond with the condition of each element, as opposed to proposing whole-scale replacement of the veranda railings and columns. So the range of treatments include in-kind replacement of areas of floor planks and stairs, the repair of columns and railings, as well as the repainting of the veranda railings and columns. And looking at section 4.3.6 of the standards and guidelines, we see guidance on entrances, porches, and balconies. This proposal certainly aligns very well with guidelines 4.9, which recommend assessing the condition of entrances, porches, and balconies early in the planning process so that the scope of work is based on current conditions. Um, and also repairing parts of entrances, porches, or balconies by patching, piecing in, consolidating, or otherwise reinforcing using recognized conservation methods. Next slide, please. Section 4.5.2 of the Standards and Guidelines provides direction for when wood is identified as a character defining element of an historic place, which is certainly the case um, for this application. The proposal follows the guidance well, particularly guidelines 14, 16, and 17. Guidelines 14 and 16 advise retaining all sound and repairable wood that contributes to the heritage value of a historic place and repairing wood by patching, piecing, and consolidating or otherwise reinforcing wood using recognized conservation methods. Guideline 17 directs replacing in-kind extensively deteriorated or missing parts of wood elements based on documentary and physical evidence. So the original or period elements of the veranda, such as the railings and columns, are being repaired as necessary and repainted. The bases of all the columns, both the large on the portico as well as the small on the veranda, are being, are being replaced in kind due to their extensive deterior deterioration. The most expansive in-kind replacement is of the floor planks and stairs, both of which are likely not original. Next slide, please. The proposed methods for cleaning and preparing and painting the wood also appear to follow best practice. We had one Heritage Kingston member comment that it would be prudent to paint all sides of the new floor planks to improve their longevity. Um, alternatively, had a, we had another member comment that it may be prudent to leave one side unpainted to allow moisture to escape. The applicant has confirmed that they plan on painting all four sides of the new floor planks before being installed. Um, and they are present at this meeting, so certainly we can have a discussion about them, that approach uh, following this presentation. Next slide. So in summary, Standard 8 of Parks Canada's standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places encourages the maintenance of character-defining elements on an ongoing basis and the repair of character-defining elements by reinforcing the materials using recognized conservation methods. The repair and repainting of the verandas and portico will ensure their long-term preservation by restricting water ingress into the wood elements and preventing further deterioration. The repair and in-kind replacement of severely deteriorated elements will conserve the verandas and portico, which are heritage attributes of this property. So moving the next slide for you you'll see staff's recommendation including um, on the next slide several conditions to the approval thank you very much okay thank you very much uh, alex we're on a part four so committee members questions comments thoughts Don Taylor. Yes, well, this does appear to be a very uh, carefully planned uh, renovation. I don't think uh, the community members should have any uh, problems. It's, it's very good, but so uh, this work is being done before. Sorry, Don, I'm getting a very broken um, sound. Is your microphone all plugged in and everything? Uh, yes. Oh, that sounds better. I'll move a bit closer. That's better. Uh, okay. Uh, certainly the, plan, the plans are very uh, uh, complete and professional. I don't think we have any problems whether they paint in advance on three sides or four sides. Uh, we shouldn't really be teaching uh, them to suck eggs, but sometimes a reminder is, uh, is necessary. Uh, might also remind them that uh, uh, what's especially important is to, and remind the committee, is to paint the ends of the butt ends of planks when, when they're cut, the rock usually begins at the uncut end. So anyway, that's just a comment for whatever interest it may be. But uh, I think it's a fine application. Good, thank you. Paul Banfield? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. J just a, a, a quick question, and I may have missed something in, in the overall um, uh, uh, documentation that was supplied, but I'm just curious, what type of wood will they be using um, in their replacement or um, uh, whatever? Is it, it, will it be original to the, um, to the wood that's currently in place, or maybe the, the wood that's currently in place isn't original, and so... Okay, thank you. Who wants to answer that one? We have three of the uh, proponents with us. Welcome, Jason, Barry, and Bruce. Uh, this, this is Bruce, uh, the architect. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that one. The, uh, the one that we've selected to uh, replace it with is uh, fur. And uh, the reason we've used fur is that it has a reputation for uh, longevity uh, for your applications. It's often used in, uh, in park-like settings. Uh, I suspect that the, uh, the original material is, uh, is either a spruce or a pine, um, but, uh, but we want something that's going to be uh, resilient. So that is the, the material, Douglas fir. Good, thank you very much. Further questions? And seeing none from uh, uh, the committee members Sorry, of the Mr. public. Chair, I do believe that. Oh, Jane, sorry, Carlin. Jane. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to commend the applicant on the detailed plans and the photos. All of that information it makes it really easy to review and understand. So thanks very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members of the public. including the three of you, uh, if you wish. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chair, just, um, I, I just wanted to let you know that we don't have any members of the public in the attendees um, section oh. of the meeting today. So oh, uh, who you see on your screen is, is who is present at the moment. Well, I will just say that each time so they can never complain that the... Anyway, thank you. So we now are looking for um, uh, a mover um, and a seconder for the, for the motion as printed. Paul Benfield moving, a seconder. Councillor Doherty, thank you very much. Uh, further discussion on the motion on the floor? And seeing none, and I'd ask for those in favour of approval and those opposed. Thank you very much. And thank you, the three of you, for coming. And uh, as um, Jane said, for a, a very nicely presented uh, proposal there with all the details, obviously, that we needed. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. We move on to 124 Centre Street. Thank you. Ryan, I believe this is you. It is, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good morning. So, this uh, property is familiar to all. Uh, we saw an application from this address last month. Uh, it is 124 Centre Street at the southwest corner of Centre and Union. Uh, next slide, please. It contains the heritage building known as Otterburn House, uh, and it's designated under part four and has is subject to a heritage easement agreement with the Ontario Heritage Trust. Next slide, please. So this is the Otterburn House as seen from Centre Street. Next slide. The designating bylaw uh, was approved in 1975 and amended in 76. I've it's probably the same bylaw that uh, the previous application was designated under. Uh, <laughs> it mentions as its primary attributes, uh, the one and a half story stucco covered Regency style stone house it was built in 1830, including the arched entrance way, uh, the tall rectangular windows with front containing French doors, side lights and transoms, uh, the tall narrow side windows uh, resting on a wooden base course, small casement windows in the wings, uh, the hip roof with later dormers and its large garden. So what is before the committee today? Uh, so this is a concurrent views of the property. As an application for a series of alterations uh, under section 33, which is part four of the Heritage Act. Um, they are looking to uh, replicate and replace the main front porch. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, well, it doesn't really show the porch. Um, <laughs> uh, including the decks, ramps, the handrails, uh, with a, a similar uh, wood decking uh, being painted to match 
the existing colors. They're also looking to replacing the roofing uh, with a, a, either an asphalt shingle or an EnviroShake uh, product in a similar tone, gray, brown, or, or black in the dark tone. Uh, retaining and repairing all the windows and doors with like materials, uh, matching the color uh, that's the current existing uh, with an option to install uh, interior storms uh, with no grill pattern. Uh, repairing some stucco cladding around the building as needed, updating some of the landscaping, including the removal of two maple trees along Union Street in the vicinity of where the former stone wall was, um, and planting a hedgerow in its place, uh, updating the uh, heating, ventilating, uh, and air conditioning system, as well as the electrical and communication systems in the building, which may involve some new venting and uh, perforations into the rear of the building. Uh, and the possible location of some compressor units at the rear. Uh, this view we're looking at is actually from Union Street, so it's the side of the building. Uh, and finally, the uh, installation of a new fire escape at the rear. Uh, a detailed uh, history and overview of the application was prepared by Laterno Heritage Consulting, who are agents for this applicant and are present today. So next slide, please. So the first application, in terms of our review, I'm gonna go through each of these. Uh, this is the porch uh, proposal. The designation bylaw includes a variety of, of uh, features of, exterior, of the exterior that are of heritage value, uh, but doesn't reference the front porch specifically. However, the porch is a prominent feature uh, on a primary elevation of the heritage building. Uh, and as a result, alterations to this porch could have an impact on the, the heritage attributes of the and character of the property. Uh, the guidelines state that uh, when replacing a porch, the porch should be designed to be compatible with the building's style and character. Now, as porches deteriorate more quickly uh, than other features and are replaced over time based on taste and need, it's difficult to know exactly the style of porch that would have been original to this building. Uh, the current porch is discreet. It's designed and serves the needs of the owners. Uh, it has existed in this uh, design for many, many years. Uh, and has become an accepted part of the character of this property. Uh, staff have no objection to, uh, to simply replicating and repairing the existing porch uh, as in its current uh, configuration and design. Next slide, please. The roofing, as you can see by the pictures, is deteriorating. The roof, hip roof, is specifically noted as a heritage attribute, particularly on a one and a half story Regency style building. Uh, roof is a prominent feature, um, and the choice of roofing is important uh, in conserving the heritage character of the building. Now, in the 1830s, uh, the roofing was probably a wood shingle or shake uh, when it was original. Uh, the use of uh, plain asphalt shingles has become an acceptable alternative to more costly cedar shingles. Um, and a more, however, a more recent product, the EnviroShake, uh, which is a composite uh, engineered product that resembles Cedar Shakes, um, but at a less cost uh, and improved longevity. The applicants are requesting approval of, op of both options uh, at this point. Uh, and in terms of the federal guidelines, uh, they, it notes that uh, when replacing roofing, uh, in, if the original material is not uh, technically or economically feasible, then a compatible substitute material may be considered. And the staff have no objection to replacing the existing roofing with either product proposed. And you can see the sort of color ranges that they're considering. Next slide, please. The windows and doors are certainly an important part and a heritage attribute of this building. Their retention and the conservation are extremely important to uh, conserving the character of, of Otterburn. The proposed scope of the work uh, for the doors and windows is commendable and supportable uh, from a heritage uh, preservation perspective. The option to install interior storm windows with no muttons uh, will add a greater level of protection against the elements and will have virtually no impact to the uh, heritage character of the property. And we support that installation. Uh, we do note that there are some existing storm windows, uh, wooden storm windows, and we uh, would encourage the proponents to repair and reuse the existing exterior storms um, as their first option and as part of the repair plans for the windows. Next slide, please. The quote, large garden is noted as an, in the description of the, in the designation bylaw. As a specific, uh, specific features, however, such as the, the vegetation, the trees are not identified. Uh, the owner has retained Bray Heritage to design the landscaping plan for the subject property including various pruning, plantings, removal of two, the two maple trees. Uh, and the applicants also wish to make a number of upgrades uh, 
uh, as well as exterior work to the uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and electrical infrastructure of the building. Uh, so this uh, so this is the landscaping plan, and you can see the two trees that are be removed. Can I get the next slide, please? In terms of the HVAC and infrastructure upgrades, uh, they're noted there in the purple at the bottom of where the potential uh, compressor units would be located. Um, it, this upgrade may include uh, the placement of these units. Uh, this is the rear of the building and uh, out of uh, view from virtually all sides, particularly the prominent um, north and east elevations, uh, only vis visible slightly from the when approaching from the west. The, the report, uh, the consultant's report notes that every effort will be made uh, to utilize existing service entries and to locate any additional service entries to and from the property in areas of low visible impact. Um, so it's critical that the new landscaping and the HVAC units do not obstruct the view of any of the identified heritage attributes. Uh, new plantings uh, such as trees and hedges should frame and showcase the heritage resources and not obstruct it uh, from the view from the public realm. So staff have no objection to the proposed landscaping uh, options, uh, as well as the location of the HVAC units, uh, but have included a condition of approval requesting or requiring submission of the landscape plan uh, once prepared in order to review uh, the location and uh, in plantings of the plantings and screenings um, and their detailed uh, installation to ensure that, uh, that these attributes are protected. So finally, the fire escape, which uh, is before you here, uh, the new is to be located on the rear, which is the west side of the building, uh, out of view. Um, the owners are proposing to convert the small uh, second floor kitchen window. Uh, it's currently a sash to a casement unit uh, and install a metal staircase um, uh, style freestanding um, feature uh, painted to match the window trims in green. And while specific details are not yet being finalized, the applicants wish to gain heritage approval for its location and installation in principle uh, with design specifics to be reviewed and approved by staff uh, and that includes building staff to ensure uh, OBC compliance. Now as a freestanding structure only attached to the roof, this intervention would be considered reversible, uh, complying with the federal standards and guidelines and the ministry's guiding principles. Its location on the west is screened uh, by the single story addition. Uh, it will make the new fire escape only visible from the west. And uh, when viewed from uh, the primary facades, as I mentioned, the north and east, this feature will not be seen at all and it will therefore have little impact. So, staff have no concerns with this alteration. And overall, uh, the subject alterations will conserve the various attributes and improve the functionality of the subject property. Uh, and while not detracting from the cultural value of the of the whole uh, resource. So we support this application, Mr. Chair. In our uh, circulation, go to the next slide, please. I think is your recommendation. Um, building staff note that a building permit is required. Uh, they'll ask for uh, additional details for, of course, the uh, the alterations of the HVAC and the, and the uh, fire escape. Engineering noted that any permanent encroachment is not permitted on any of the road allowances. Uh, our environment team uh, flagged that uh, designated and substances and potentially hazardous materials are to be identified prior to the, the works commencing. Kingston Hydro noted the presence of some electrical services in the area and uh, just to flag that uh, if the work cannot be completed safely uh, that a disconnect uh, or isolation may be needed. And Utilities Kingston uh, just flags that uh, locates our uh, recommended before excavation in this area. Uh, in terms of committee comments, we circulated this. Uh, the comments are summarized in your agenda package uh, in Exhibit D. One responding member recommended that the porch uh, not be restored uh, to its current configuration, but rather a design to reflect a more traditional Regency style veranda. Now staff, of course, support this, uh, pr this proposal uh, based on period uh, appropriate replicas and, and documentary evidence uh, and the like. The proponents are not proposing this level of intervention at, at this time. They simply wish to restore the existing porch uh, and we, we support, I uh, uh, have no objection to that application. Uh, I understand the applicant, uh, Dr. Laterno is present today and, and uh, could speak further to this if, if uh, necessary. 
So Mr. Chair, this is uh, staff's recommendation. We support this application and recommend its approval. The second slide, next slide, uh, is the list of conditions. And I thank the chair for pointing out the error in the start of that one. Uh, the word removal, um, I would actually suggest just the word application uh, would fit okay. better in there. Uh, then we don't have this issue in the future. So uh, it is not a removal, it is an alteration. Uh, so that word should be changed. And if you have any questions, Mr. Chair, we're available. Thank you. Good, thank you. I think it was the, uh, the wall that was removed last time we were on this property. Um, thank you very much uh, for that, Ryan. Committee members, questions, comments, thoughts? Mr. Taylor. Well, this is a uh, wonderful property and uh, the committee should be pleased that uh, uh, repairs and renovations are in the works and after uh, a period of a bit of neglect, I think, um, and for the most part, what's being proposed uh, uh, is very good. But I, I do have some concerns. Um, one is, and and so I'm, there may be some need for a thought about uh, amendments later. But uh, um, I have uh, one question. I, I raised the issue of whether the um, uh, deck uh, balusters and so forth should be uh, replaced in the uh, present uh, design or whether they, uh, whether a, a more appropriate design would be possible. And so that I have a question. If this property has been uh, associated with um, uh, Beth Israel for quite a few years, do, would they have any archival information on the appearance of an early, early appearance of the uh, terrace and walkway. I don't know if Mr. Laterno would uh, have an answer to that. Yeah, Marcus? Um, actually, uh, the representative from Beth Israel, um, Michael Springer, is on the call, is on the uh, session as well. Um, Michael, um, you were there anyways. Um, they, my understanding is that there are limited records. Um, once we started on this project, that was part of the conversations we had. And they have some records, but the records are not complete. Um, I think when we were working early on with staff and with the trust, I think actually it was the city that had the earliest photograph that we had. I'm assuming there are some probably at Queens, but unfortunately with the pandemic, we haven't been able to access our traditional archival research materials. Uh, okay, thank you for that. I'll just mention to uh, remind committee members that the last page of the agenda is a picture I found of a similar Regency cottage in Dundas that shows a, a, a French doors and balustrade and so on. And uh, we may, uh, come back to that when the motion is on the floor. The other general comment uh, I would make is that I am concerned that uh, at this point we have really no idea what's going to happen to the uh, storm windows. So the, the application almost gives them carte blanche to, uh, to do uh, what they wish there. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, the fire escape, we don't have detailed designs of that, so I don't think it's appropriate for the committee to approve those areas until we have more information. So again, uh, I'm thinking of an amendment when, when the motion is on the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, to Marcus or to Ryan, will the Ontario Heritage Trust need our approval in principle before they will deal with this, or can we go the other way around? Um, Marcus? Uh, through you, um, a, a couple of notes. One of the reasons, and, and I wanted to be very candid about this, one of the reasons we are bringing forward a lot of items that are not fully flushed out at this point is the cost of the heritage permit application. Okay. Um, so far, our client has spent $600 this year on heritage permits. Um, our client is of the position we would rather get the item started start the conversation and be able to come back. 
Okay. We are still in conversation with the Ontario Heritage Trust. And indeed, for some of the things like HVAC, as well as the, um, the fire escape, we are still working with the trust to find out what they will permit. Um, so that conversation is still ongoing, but we did want to bring it forward to the committee to at least get the process started yep. with the understanding that we will need to come back with further details. Okay, thank you very much. Other questions from committee members? Paul. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm no, I'll preface this by saying I'm certainly no arborist, um, but I'm, I'm wondering, given your, your full report, uh, Marcus, regarding the uh, trees in particular that are, are, are on Union Street, and the fact that the photos that you um, supplied, why are you not taking down basically all of those trees? <laughs> it seemed to me that some of those trees, I mean, the two maples, uh, again, I, I, I'm not sure why they're coming down now other than I guess they're overhanging the uh, uh, the roof or at least it seems that way from the uh, from the photos but some of those other trees towards the uh, going down the street towards Queens look in much worse shape um, and I would f think that there might be some liability there because I very close to the to, to the walk so why why the two maples and not 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 those other trees Absolutely, that's a, a great question. Um, and it's actually the point you raised, the two that we've identified are the two overhanging the building at this point. Um, we have looked at those trees. Um, Dr. Bray, as landscape architect, did look at the trees. He said they will need to come down, but not yet. So what we're hoping to do is come forward with a revised landscape design that at that point, we're not just removing the trees, we've got a plan for what we actually want to replace. Okay, Paul. Uh, Jane, you have a hand up. I'm not sure if it was from this question or the last one. You need to unmute as well. Uh, it's for this. I actually have several questions and comments. Um, and my first question is, I seem to remember uh, that there was a major renovation done on this property in the 1980s or 1990s. And I just wondered if uh, there was any record of that uh, at either at the city or uh, uh, possibly from the, the uh, um, group that renovated it. So that's my first question. Does anyone know? <laughs> um. Marcus or through, Ryan? Through, through you, I can speak to the any records with the city. Um, some of those details were actually, we did receive some information from the Ontario Heritage Trust. Some of those renovations were done in response to the Ontario Heritage Trust easement. So the documentation report from that time did provide a little bit of information, not a lot. Um, but again, we're still trying to sort out some of the records as we found out when we were working on the wall um, we weren't even aware that there had been a previous approval until the city noted it. So our records are kind of spotty. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry, Brian, do you want to add to that? Just uh, from our perspective, Mr. Chair, uh, and I apologize to the member, I had meant to get back to her on her question. <laughs> uh, we did look into this question and we have no records on file of any building permits for that alteration in that timeline uh, and no heritage approvals either. Okay, thank you very much, Jane. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to point out that standards and, and guidelines uh, in, it, with regard to the porch, deck and ramp, they do also mention that's compatible with the era of the building. And I really appreciate uh, that picture from Jennifer McKendry uh, regarding uh, the property in Dundas and that which is a similar era and I mean, I guess Bellevue House is also a similar era. I think this building is actually, uh, Otterburn is older than Bellevue House. But again, if you're looking at style of balusters and, and uh, the railing, you might, uh, uh, it might be nicer to uh, replace it with something that's more appropriate for the era. Um, that the other question I have, is there any history on the shutters? They seem to have been there at one point and then disappeared and come back. They look very authentic. Do, can anyone comment on that? 
Um, what I can advise, and this is just from working on the property, we did find some shutters in the basement. Um, so I don't know if those were the originals or if they were the template for the, the ones that are there. Okay. Uh, and uh, my next question is about the missing storm. So if you look at the photos or do a walkabout uh, in front of the property and beside it, you can see that there are storm windows, exterior storms on some of them uh, and some spots. So you might have two exterior storms and one missing that's on the front facade. Um, and I'm just wondering if you have plans to replace the missing exterior storms. They could be reproduced from the existing. Um, we, we've not identified that at this point, but I think we can, I, I will speak with our, our client and see if what is in the basement, um, they actually might be there. So I would like, I would prefer to check to see what is actually in the structure at this point. Right. And I mean, I think that it's uh, good practice to uh, reproduce from what's available. And obviously there's a lot available in terms of exterior storms. And you might not, if you can re reproduce the ones that are missing, and it's pretty obvious when you look at it, which ones are missing. So hopefully they are in the basement, but they can be reproduced from what's there. And um, I think you might find that you don't need the interior storms then, and that would be great. Um, those are fantastic looking storms that are on the outside and if they can be repaired and, and or reproduced, I think you'd have, have a really nice looking facade there. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, just on that point, the intent is not to remove the existing storms. Um, right. Yeah, we, we are planning to keep the storms that are existing on the structure there are, there are some windows where we are looking at restoring the windows, but there is some concern about the ability that if it's not sufficient, we may look at an, a third interior window in some way. Right. So. Um, that's great. Um, can you confirm regarding roofing that if you don't uh, opt for Enviro Shakes, that the asphalt you would choose would be plain, solid colored, dark three tab shingles? Yes, that it's three black, three, uh, black asphalt three tab. Okay, yeah, uh, dark colored, yep. Um, and um, I wanted to ask about the fencing, uh, which is quite deteriorated. And I guess that's part of the uh, landscape plan. Is the plan to uh, uh, reproduce that or do you know? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, in talks with the city and with the trust, the fencing was not identified as a heritage attribute. Our intent at this point was to just remove the fence and then bring a new design forward. So, Okay, right. Um, and I did notice that there are some uh, pictures at Queen's archives, uh, uh, both of Center Street and of Otterburn. But again, as you said, uh, it's pretty awkward um, accessing that right now. So hopefully um, you might be able to get to those later. Thanks very much for all your answers. Good, thank you, Jane. Uh, Andrea has a hand up. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to, to make a quick note that it is it is possible to get photos through Queen's Archives digitally through email. Um, so all you need to do is tell them the, the number of the record, which you can search on their website in the database, and then they will actually send you a digital copy of the photo. Um, I think there is a charge of about $10 per photo, but but I see I see on the archive database right now that there are a couple of photos. So I think it's worthwhile tracking those down. Thank you. Good, thank you, Andrew. Further questions from the committee? And seeing none. Oh, Ryan, you have a hand up? Is that just an old hand? Yeah. No, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to quickly add that the wording in the motion uh, with respect to the landscape plan was specifically to address some of the comments that uh, had come out, some of the questions. Things like additional trees, uh, pruning, removal, the fencing um, and plantings and a number of features that uh, might need to be improved uh, on the property. Our interest from a conservation perspective is simply to make sure that none of those interfere with the, the visibility and prominence of the, the attributes of the property. So because there's 
a number of details that are yet to be ironed out, it was thought that it was best to, um, and because the property itself is important to the heritage of the building, uh, that we asked for uh, the applicant to provide a, a detailed landscape plan that we will look at just to ensure that it's not, uh, not going to obstruct any of the attributes. So uh, we're hoping, you know, they will address some of these details that was asked about through that process uh, without the need for uh, having to look at each one individually by this group. Uh, it was just thought it was not, uh, not the best use of everyone's time for this particular property. So I just I thought that might help explain hey, our, thank our you. intent. Marcus, you have a hand. Yes, uh, just one minor note. Our materials identified that the proposed deck would be in cedar in talking with staff and the trust. Uh, both are amenable to other types of wood. Um, and we actually wanted to say we appreciate that of staff. We've actually tried to cost the cedar and we were going to ask the city if we could use a different type of wood. So um, uh, my understanding from Ryan is that the motion, wording of the motion does not preclude different types of material as long as it's wood. Yep, okay. Committee, Donald Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, I just wanted to caution about the landscaping plan um, or just give some context. I know at uh, Sydney Street United Church, when we did our bell tower in 96, a lot of the trees came down. Uh, in the 11 years I've been there, one of the big trees that was a major focal point for years and years had to come down. And so what we have now, because of the way we've planted over time, is you have a whole range of trees. So when I heard landscaping plan and everything, I had this idea that you know, it's all going to be taken down and replanted. You may want to strategically time delay and even with what you plant, look at the varying heights because I know the public, at least around Sydney Street, really like the variation of trees. And it's amazing even in 10 years or 15 hmm. years, how much they can grow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Don. Other comments from committee? And I believe we've got still have no public, so I don't have to ask that one. So I'm looking for a motion uh, with the one word change um, from removal to application. Uh, you have the seven points of the motion and 12 conditions. Looking for a mover, please. Don Taylor and a seconder, Donald Mitchell. Thank you very much. Further discussion, Don Taylor. Okay, well, as I mentioned, I, I have some concerns about the details of the recommendations and conditions, but uh, actually they're just the conditions. Uh, let me speak a bit more about storm windows. Uh, Jane has already uh, discussed them, and this is one of the most difficult areas that the committee deals with. And I should say the windows policy is really uh, useless when it comes to storm windows, because every property is different. Um, storm windows, well, the real question is whether a storm window is a heritage attribute or not. Some of them are, some of them are not. Some buildings, some old buildings never did have storm windows and they were added later. Some, uh, many, in many cases, the storm windows have been replaced uh, periodically because of deterioration and so, uh, quite often nowadays you have aluminum storm windows. Uh, nowadays with um, the um, sort of trend to going towards uh, insulated glass units, many applicants, to many applicants, the idea of storm windows is like uh, going back to the horse and buggy era. They are simply not to be considered and to be honest, I have a lot of sympathy. I think we should have a lot of sympathy with them. Storm windows should be uh, put up and removed uh, uh, twice a year, uh, but a lot of people don't bother doing that. And uh, what that means is that windows don't get washed and the whole, uh, the interior windows don't get ventilation and so they deteriorate more rapidly. So if you're going to have storm windows, they really should be taken down and put back up every year. But nowadays, particularly on tall buildings, 
uh, you're not really supposed to use extension ladders. You're supposed to bring in a zoom bucket to uh, to uh, change the windows at high levels. And uh, you know, again, a lot of people are just going to say no way. And in, may, in many cases, there are uh, utilities lines which need to be protected. The city has to come and protect them before you can go near those windows. So the, the situation is really pretty terrible. And I, so I think what I'm saying is this committee needs to be flexible and we need to look at every property on its own merit and its own window on its own merit. And from what I can see from this property and you know we haven't been inside or anything like that, the ground floor French door storm windows are wonderful. They really are important heritage attributes. The upper ones, some of them probably are original, some of them probably are not. But what uh, occurs to me is that <clears throat> if the owners are reluctant to uh, um, uh, have new windows installed and the fuss of removing them and washing them and so on so often, uh, we should be sympathetic to uh, an interior storm panel. And because these are casements, that is easy to do. You don't, all you have to do is put a pane of glass on, on the interior sash with a little frame around it, and that's it. Uh, uh, every 20 years or so, you might uh, unscrew that uh, sash and wash inside, but uh, it, it is really very effective, very simple. And, and you know, I, if, if owners, put in an argument for doing that, I think we should listen to them. So anyway, I think the, the question of uh, storm windows is much too complicated for us to simply give uh, heritage staff and the applicants uh, uh, an open hand. I think what I'm <clears throat> going to suggest is that condition eight be amended that's the one that refers to windows. And what I'm suggesting is that where it says design specifics for the interior storm windows, details, glazing patterns, color for review and approval, insert by Heritage Kingston. I think it needs to come back to us and uh, should remind everybody that uh, council is required to consult Heritage Kingston on alterations. And uh, we should not uh, delegate our approval to staff in areas where there is a lot of uncertainty. I mean, a lot of these conditions that we routinely approve say that uh, any, any minor deviations from the submitted plans can be delegated to staff or the manager. Well, there are no plans. We're not talking about deviations. We need plans and they have to be, they should be approved by us. So I'm moving that amendment. I think uh, Elizabeth has a copy of it. Uh, so I hope it can go forward. Thank you. So do I understand then that in condition eight at the bottom of page 34, of the report, you would replace planning staff with Kingston? Uh, no, uh, leave it the way it is. But when you get to review and approval, insert by Heritage Kingston. You want to do it that way. So yes. for review and approval by Heritage Kingston. I mean, we're happy to work with staff on this. They need to collect the information, distribute it, and maybe circulate it for comments and so on. But uh, we have, I think we should approve something as important as this. Madam Clerk, do you need that in writing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have received um, part of this motion from Mr. Taylor in writing. Um, I can put that up on the screen if you give me uh, two minutes here or probably just a minute, I can put that up on the screen so that um, members okay. of the committee can see. Thank you very much. So you've got a minute if you need a break.
Thank you very much. So recommendation, uh, sorry, condition eight is amended by inserting by Heritage Kingston after for review and approval. Any questions on that? So you understand the motion there. Uh, I need a seconder and then we can discuss it. Moved by Don Taylor, seconded by Donald Mitchell. Thank you very much. Discussion. Councillor Doherty. Um, I just have a question regarding process. Does this mean that um, no work can go ahead until it actually comes back to Heritage at the next month? And what's the time and how will this affect the, the, the project, I guess, the time-wise? Don, what is your intention there, that it will come back to a future Heritage Kingston meeting? You're muted at present. I would say not necessarily. Um, if uh, the plans are submitted to um, staff and they circulate them to the committee and uh, uh, we can um, uh, comment and um, I'm not sure if it has to come back. I, I, you know, I guess in these COVID-19 days, maybe uh, uh, we could approve it by email in some way, but I'm not an expert on procedures here. But yeah. I think the important thing is that all the other renovations and plans can go ahead. These are storm windows are uh, something that can be dealt with at a later, you know, at leisure, so to speak. Okay, let's ask Ryan then, if I can. Can this be uh, put up on Dash and all comments received by you through Dash? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually uh, had the same question as, as <laughs> Councillor Doherty on this one. Um, just two points. Um, first of all, I'm a little cautious about using the word approved. As you know, uh, the Heritage Committee is simply an advisory body and doesn't have the authority to actually approve anything. So I wanted to be clear on that. I think it's important that we we word this motion properly. Um, secondly, I, I uh, support, I agree with, uh, with Member Taylor that uh, uh, that I think this could be done as a more of an informal process. Um, so perhaps we build in a review component, uh, consultation, if you want to use that word, into uh, the motion itself uh, with the committee. Uh, we certainly can, can put the plans on DASH and send out a circulation to let the committee members know that it's there um, and provide feedback. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's certainly a way of working that into there, if that's, if that's the desire of, of the mover and seconder. Yeah, and I would comment also, I, I know what you're saying about the word approval, but the set of conditions starts that the approval be subject to. So I think we're talking about the, um, uh, the overall recommendation to council uh, is what approval probably means there. Um, but Don and Donald, does that sound appropriate that when the um, specifications are received, they will be put up on Dash, everybody will be asked to comment and um, it may need to come back to a future meeting or it may be appropriate there. Don Mitchell? Um, you used the word already, but why not just switch out approval and put comment for review and comment by Heritage Kingston? Well, Ryan says yes. Elizabeth, <laughs> can you type? Well, it's Don's motion, but... Don, is that okay with you that it would say Review and comments. I think we all understand. I think we all understand that uh, this process can work in a maybe informal way. Um, you know, <clears throat> quite often these conditions give approval uh, to. Um, heritage staff, or at least they mention approval by heritage staff and by the manager. So I'm not too worried about the word approval, but I have no objection to replacing approval by comment. 
Uh, so that's moved and seconded. Elizabeth? Mr. Chair, if I could just um, provide a little bit of additional uh, information here. In terms of openness and transparency, uh, it is typically best that anything that's coming back for review or is being commented on by the committee as a whole should be done in a public format. Unfortunately, the DASH comments, while they are provided in the report, if this matter doesn't come back to this committee, the public may not have the opportunity to review those comments. Um, and if they have their own comments, they would like to add to it as well. They wouldn't be given the opportunity. Therefore, I would suggest uh, that perhaps uh, this should be coming back to committee if uh, the committee would wish to add further comments to the recommendation that is going to council. Well, if you leave it as approval by Heritage Kingston, I presume it has to come back. as a one small part motion um, at a future meeting. And it will be only delayed by at the maximum for four weeks. Mr. Chair, if I could, um, uh, Deputy CD Clerk, uh, Ms. Janet Jaynes is on the call as well. If she could yep. just uh, provide some additional comments on how to properly word this. Janet, do you want to comment here, please? Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity to comment, Mr. Chair. Just to uh, to supplement what uh, um, what Elizabeth has said is uh, it, it's also well, it's an important nuance to uh, to realize that the recommendation that's being provided to Heritage Kingston is that Heritage Kingston recommend that council approve. Mm -hmm. So the use of the word approval is not that Heritage Kingston is approving something, Heritage Kingston is recommending that council approve it. So it's a small nuance, but it is a nuance nonetheless. It's not an approval by the committee uh, because as, uh, as Ryan indicated, the committee does not have the ability to make that approval. Uh, so I think it is a, a, a small word change, but I think it's an important word change uh, to, uh, to indicate that in the amendment uh, that uh, the staff can obtain comment from Heritage Kingston and if there are any uh, major changes that are, are needed then that would need necessitate a return to the committee uh, as Elizabeth mentioned so that if there is a further opportunity uh, for the public to provide that comment uh, openness and transparency is of utmost importance to both staff and the Council of the City of Kingston and, and we want to make sure that it does not appear that decisions are being made behind uh, you know outside of a duly constituted public meeting. Thanks very much. So you would prefer the word comments to approval and then the process come back through the committee at a future meeting? Yes, that's correct, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. So mover and seconder, can we change um, your um, uh, amendment to read and comments for review and comments by Heritage Kingston? Don Taylor, go to unmute first. Thank you. I'm okay with that, but I, I'm a little concerned um, to make sure that if the rest of the um, application is approved, that it, will, it can go to council uh, sort of as soon as appropriate. Um, and so it's only this one item, uh, perhaps, that comes back to uh, yes. the committee. That's my understanding. Okay, that's fine with me. Then. Okay, Don Mitchell. You're okay. Okay, so it would then read, if we can, Elizabeth, and comments by Heritage, for review and comments by Heritage Kingston prior to installation. And that in fact would give a maximum of a one month delay from the moment that the decision has been made, or the, the request has been made to when it's uh, um, approved uh, and sent on to council, presumably just by itself as a separate, uh, separate item. Elizabeth, are you happy with what we've done? For review and comment. Oh, yes, very good. Excellent. So we now have an, an amended motion. Uh, both Don Taylor and Donald Mitchell agree with the wording that says inserting by Heritage Kingston after for review and comment in that condition number eight. Further questions on that? And seeing none, uh, oh, sorry, yes, 
Sorry, Mr. Chair, I know I'm, I'm jumping in late there. I do see that Mr. Letourneau has his hand raised. I, I do realize that we are speaking about an amendment, but perhaps uh, if this amendment is going to be affecting the project, um, if Mr. Letourneau has some uh, additional comments for the committee, um, Mr. Chair, it's, if, if you would permit him to speak. That okay, would be... Marcus. Thank you, through you. And I believe our client has rejoined uh, the conversation. Um, Michael, I hope you are on. Um, a couple of questions based upon some of the comments that were made. Um, Mr. Leary noted that this would be reposted to Dash. And our first question would be is who is going to be responsible for posting it to Dash? Because going back to our earlier point, if we submit it as an application, we are going to have to pay for that. So I think that's one of the concerns that I would raise right up front. Um, Second, I would, um, Michael, um, in terms of timing, would coming back with the detailed design um, be acceptable to, the, to you as the client? I don't know if you can hear. Yeah, is he under, is, is Michael Springer, is he under your name? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's to, that'll be him. And I don't. Oh, I, 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 can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. I was having a little bit of difficulty. I think the question was, would be, would we be okay with deferring um, discussion on the windows uh, on the, on the uh, strong windows until later? Is that correct? I'm just, my fault. Is that I'm just, I've been having technical difficulties. So Marcus's question is, is this, uh, to you was, is this delay likely to cause any problems? I, I, I think that delay um, specifically on the storm windows um, would, would be acceptable providing the rest of um, our, our request is dealt with today. Okay, and to Ryan, the question was about um, posting on Dash. And who does that and so on thank you mr chair uh i the way i was in my head anyway uh, pro, uh, planning to process this was once we receive the details from the applicant which may or may not allow us to bring this back in april uh but we will do our best uh we will then upload it or they will upload it into their current account their current application and we will uh, advance it as part of that current application and not uh, a separate matter no. Uh, this was already submitted as part of their current proposal, and this is just a detail that uh, we have the ability to send a, another circulation under the same account. So I don't Good. anticipate a new fee. Yep. Thank you. Marcus, does that satisfy you? Okay. So we're back to discussion on the amendment still, which both the mover and the seconder have approved. Further discussion by committee on that amendment, which would ask for comments um, to come here and seeing none, those in favor of the amendment. And one, two, three, four, five, thank you very much. That passes back to the amended motion. Is there any further discussion on the amended motion? Done. Uh <laughs> Yes, I'm also. Uh, I also wanted to speak to the uh, uh, the porch or walkway, um, and uh, I've already mentioned this. But uh, again, I'd like to um, sorry. Um, I'm getting ahead of myself. The other, the other. Um, question was about the fire escape because we have no plans for the fire escape and uh, I don't uh, feel that it's appropriate for this committee to approve uh, the installation of a fire escape that we uh, don't have any plans for. Um, no, it's, it's just a question of, uh, of um, doing our uh, due diligence so what I would suggest is we do exactly the same for condition 11, which refers to, um, refers to the um, fire escape. And 
a move an amendment to insert the words uh, review and comment by Heritage Kingston prior to installation. So it's the same sort of amendment as condition eight. So basically I'm saying the committee needs to see uh, plans for the fire escape before we approve them. Sorry, I'm just finding where we've got review and comment in condition 11. We've got review and approval in this yeah, case. So, change, so review, make that review and comment by Heritage Kingston. Okay. Do we have a seconder for that amendment? Jennifer, thank you. So the um, amendment, the motion to amend 11 to read heritage planning staff shall be, shall be provided design specifics for the fire escape, including materials, installation details, and color for review and comment by Heritage Kingston prior to installation in order to confirm no negative impacts to the heritage attributes of the property. Discussion? Donald Mitchell? I think I have a little more problem with, with this one. One is it's, um, the, the windows um, don't, to my mind, uh, stop the use and the ability of the building, but the fire escape might. So timing might be an issue on that one. Uh, second of all, it's a reversible change is my understanding, um, so that um, it shouldn't in theory affect the heritage. And we've heard some explanation of it. And the third thing I'd mention is my only concern with it actually is to do with uh, often with these types of installations, um, they're done in such a fashion that snow will be pushed right up against a building or against an element that might deteriorate over time. And I could see heritage um, having some concern about how it is exactly detailed to the building, maybe to keep it further away from attributes. So um, I, I'm more concerned about this one um, being held up in the same fashion. Those are my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Further comments? Seeing none, you have a mover, a moved and seconded motion, which will replace in 11 for review and comment by Heritage Kingston prior to installation. Those in favor? Those opposed? That carries. Do we have any further amendments? Don Taylor. Yes, uh, sorry to uh, drag this out, but uh, we've already discussed the design of the uh, walkway balusters and so on. And uh, we don't really seem to have a clear uh, understanding of what's going to happen. I think it's been said that it would be good to have uh, a, per a period uh, design and uh, th that probably the archives uh, might have some information. And uh, so, uh, at the moment, the recommendation simply says, replace the existing porch with like for like. And uh, I'm not going to suggest that we force them to do anything, but I think we should put in a statement saying this committee uh, really would like the applicants to uh, consider using uh, a more period appropriate design. And uh, Again, it's, it's a condition, it's not a recommendation. So uh, my amendment is to add a condition 13, which I think uh, Elizabeth has, uh, which is simply to say that uh, the applicants should consider, uh, here it is, in rebuilding the walkway, the applicants should consider choosing balusters and posts in a style more sympathetic with the Regency architecture. And um, I guess, you know, I, I'm sure uh, the applicants are thinking of their budget, but the, if they're re completely replacing this walkway, that's a big project. All the flooring, the decking, the stairs, the joists, 
the balusters are really only a small part of that. And yes, fancy balusters will cost a little bit more than uh, the minimum ones. But, uh, you know, I think it's an investment that uh, they should consider. I think owners of heritage buildings should get some, uh, a bit of uh, uh, pride or pleasure in improving the, the appearance and bringing it back the way it was. So I think we should make a statement that they should consider uh, a more appropriate design for the balusters. So that's the purpose of the amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Looking for a seconder. Jane McFarlane, it's on the floor for discussion. Those who wish to discuss it from the committee. Uh, Councillor Doherty. I just want to add that I think uh, Mr. Tiller is correct, and I think the end result will be uh, really uh, pleasing for everyone, including the owners. So I do encourage them to do, do exactly that. Thanks. Good. Thank you very much. Further comments, Donald Mitchell? Uh, I just have a question for staff on a separate um, tangent of it, but by changing the walkway is it uh, open up AODA considerations and whether or not um, accessibility becomes a factor in consultation for accessibility? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I can respond to that, I, I think. Well, I can respond that I don't have a response. <laughs> um, I, I guess the, you, I, the member is asking if they change the design I, of the of the porch, will it have an AODA impact? I, I guess the answer is we don't know because we don't know exactly what the new design would entail. Uh, the motion that the member had is uh, uh, a more appropriate Regency style and I, I don't even entirely sure what that means. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. It was something we will have to address if, if they change their plans, we'll have to look at that. Okay, thank you very much. Jane, you have a hand up. And you need to understand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just support, I do support uh, this, obviously, since I seconded it. But um, I, we're just talking about bolsters and posts here. We're not talking, so that's like the very obvious portion. We're not talking about the decking or the accessibility. And wanted to make that clear. It's designing it so that it looks uh, more era, era appropriate for this building. And I think it would be great. Okay, thank you. Andrea, just you had a hand up. Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clarify that the the accessibility requirements will be will need to be met through the building code um, process as well. Um, so that's something that when when we get the additional details on the, the design, we'll work with our building department to make sure that it's meeting those requirements. Um, okay. And just just a quick note that um, with railings in the building code, the the Regency railings are usually really low, and they don't meet current building code requirements. So that is sometimes an issue with these kinds of um, attempts at replicating. Thank you. Good, thank you. There was a hand up, Donald. Uh, just as follow up, my concern is when you change uh, things, the width would change. And the second concern I have is that um, the when does a small change become something that should be factored in a big level. And so this is a ramp that's obviously built um, and it's a, a different era and different design for accessibility. And if you're going to open up the scope of making a change, you might open up that scope even wider to provide optimum accessibility with some of the new uh, techniques and methods that we have now. So it just felt like a bit of mission creep that if you're going to change one element, at what point is it required to sort of be a, evaluated on a fuller level rather than just one particular aspect? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Further comments? And seeing none then, we go back to vote on the amendment. And I didn't write that down. Can we get that up on the screen, Elizabeth? Please and thank you. There we go. So we're adding a new condition 13, which reads in rebuilding the walkway deck, the applicants should consider choosing balusters and posts in a style more sympathetic with the Regency architecture of the house. It's moved and seconded. We finished discussion, we'll take the vote. Those in favor. Three, four, five, six, 
votes and that will pass and those opposed okay thank you very much that passes um so you now have a condition 13. further discussion on the amended motion Oh, we've worn everybody out. Okay, we go back then to a motion, which I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, it has four changes to the printed version, though you'll remember. Um, although the alterations do not, it's the uh, conditions which, um, which have been changed. Does anybody need to question what they're about to vote on? Excellent. Those in favor of the amended motion on 124 Center Street? Those opposed, that carries. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Marcus, for your help, and Michael Springer for your help on that. Um, and good luck with uh, that fascinating project. We move on to 47 Wellington Street, which is part five, I believe, Ryan. It is both part five and part four, but for processing purposes, yes, Mr. Chair, it's part five. Part five, yep. So you introduce it. I will do so. Um, yeah, so this is uh, 47 Wellington Street. Uh, it's on the east side of Wellington. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, between Gore and Earl Streets in the old Sydenham Heritage Conservation District. Uh, next slide, please. So the property is, uh, includes the landmark limestone heritage building, former uh, school turned warehouse turned residence uh, in, uh, on Wellington Street. Next slide, please. And these are some pictures of the front and rear, and we'll get into specifics in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned, it is designated under both parts four from 1984 and under part five as part of the district in 2015. Uh, this statement in the 1984 bylaws pretty limited as you can see, uh, but it does note the architect John Power and the date of construction 1873. So next slide, please. Uh, just a little background. Actually, we could leave it on the previous slide. I'll get into these slides in a second. Um, just a little background, as you are probably familiar with this property, uh, it received a Heritage Act approval in 2019 for a four-story rear addition. Uh, the previous application was focused entirely on the appropriateness and impacts of that new addition uh, and alteration specifically to the rear of the building to accommodate it. Uh, as the, uh, the work was uh, progressed and the details of the renovations plans have evolved, it has become necessary to now request approval to make a number of alterations to the heritage building, the former school building, which is what's before us today. Also, as background, you may remember a recent emergency approval was issued uh, in December of last year uh, to allow a section of the rear south wall to be uh, repaired. Uh, the masonry was questionable and, uh, and uh, those involved were wanted to repair it. So that work is currently underway as well. So what is before us today is a application for alteration under section 42, which is part five of the Heritage Act. Uh, and it relates to the historic former school building. And I'll quickly go through these. Uh, there's about 10 of them. Uh, we can leave the slide where it is for now. I'll go through those details in a moment. But the applicants are planning to replace a total of 38 later windows on all sides of the building uh, with metal clad wood from Norwood painted black to match the existing uh, window patterns and styles. This includes 16 windows on the north elevation, 10 windows on the south, six on the east, and six windows on the west. There's also 17 period windows on the north elevation that are to be retained and repaired. Uh, and this is to be addressed under a separate application as, uh, as detailed condition reports have not yet been prepared. Uh, the applicants are looking at infilling portions of the uh, four rear facing door openings with matching limestone uh, recessed slightly to accommodate three new windows and, uh, and the fourth to be blinded. Uh, repair and replacement of two south facing and one north facing door with metal clad wood doors. Uh, new metal cresting on the tower. Uh, replace the main front steps uh, with wood textured concrete stairs. Um, replace and re replace or repair uh, the main front door um, with a, a similar wooden door uh, painted black. 
with glazing and portions of the door. Uh, replace the roofing with a gray asphalt roofing. Uh, repair rain gear uh, on with gray aluminum product on the uh, same profile and locations throughout the building. Repair all wooden features uh, with similar materials and, and profiles uh, when painted gray uh, using I just said some materials. Uh, and finally, the installation of a number of uh, lighting fixtures on the building. And detailed plans were prepared and uh, submitted by members of Schultz and Zabeck Architects, who I believe are present today. So we can get into our review. So uh, as you know, 47 Wellington Street is a significant landmark in the district uh, and sits prominently on Wellington Street. The central tower uh, is a striking and prominent feature of this building. The proponents wish to replicate and reinstall the cresting on the tower, uh, which was removed many years ago. Uh, the HCD plan, uh, as well as both Parks Canada's standards and guidelines and uh, the Ministry's Heritage Toolkit, direct one to understand the details of the historic place and only replicate features such as cresting based on documentary and physical evidence. A condition of approval has been included to ensure that the new cresting is designed to match the historic photographs, which are actually quite clear uh, and very helpful. Next slide, please. Section 434 of the district plan speaks to original porches uh, and verandas and, and the like, uh, and states that uh, they should be retained. Uh, the current porch, uh, while designed and located in its original location, and perhaps the stone knee walls are original, uh, but the the treads and risers uh, are uh, a replacement, uh, which is noted by the modern pressure shaded lumber that is used on them. Uh, the applicant was to replace the current wooden porch with a concrete version uh, to be stamped to resemble a textured wood. And there's an example before you there. The applicants uh, have noted that the wooden stairs allow snow, salt and rain to pass through it. And it creates a safety hazard and maintenance problem uh, for the use of the access to the basement entrance underneath. The new concrete structure, according to the applicants, uh, with its, quote, crystalline waterproofing additive will reduce or eliminate this problem, unquote. Uh, the existing limestone knee walls, um, including the arched access to the basement entrance, will be retained. Uh, the existing metal railing is to be refurbished and retained as well. Uh, the profile and appearance of the new stairs will be similar to the existing and will improve functionality and access to the building. While the HCD plan discourages the use of fiberglass and plastic uh, replicas of wooden porches, the use of concrete is neither discouraged nor recommended. Uh, staff have no objection to the replacement of the wooden steps with concrete structure that matches uh, the original scale and profile, provided, of course, that the knee walls and uh, are properly integrated and retained uh, and the texture and the required um, textile warning strips are not a bright color. Uh, conditions of approval have been added to this effect. Um, the use of a bright colored concrete, a bright white concrete is also discouraged and we have included a condition to recommend that it be tinted to a, a gray tone uh, just in order so it doesn't contrast with the aged limestone of the building. Next slide please. With uh, respect to the doors, uh, the three basement doors, which you can see here, uh, two on the south elevation, one on the north, are likely not original to the building. Uh, they're out of view from the public realm. The applicants are proposing to repair and repaint the uh, garbage door, which is the middle of the middle, uh, and replace the other two with wooden versions, possibly with metal cladding uh, that match the profile of those doors. Next slide, please. The main front door appears to be a later replacement door as well, not original. Uh, however, it is well designed and appropriate to the style of the building. While obvious deterioration is evident in the lower portion of the wooden doors, a full assessment of its condition has not yet been provided. Uh, in accordance with the city's window policy, which we routine, re routinely use um, to assess proposed door alterations, the guidelines in section, as well as the guidelines in section 435, uh, of Parks Canada standards. Um, staff have included a condition of approval that requires the applicants to retain a qualified carpenter to uh, review the condition of the door and determine if repairing that feature is possible. If repairs to the existing door are not, are, are to the extent that it would result in essentially a new door, uh, staff would support the replacement of the existing doors with a modern wooden version that matches the style of the existing door. The applicants initially proposed new doors with glazing in both the upper and lower, which is what you see there. Um, 
but have agreed to remove the glazing in the lower panels uh, to better reflect the pattern of the existing doors. So it will look similar to the uh, one on the left, which is the existing. Next slide, please. The 38 windows uh, proposed to be replaced are later replacement windows. Many of them are vinyl or aluminum. Uh, they're not considered heritage contributing windows. The proposed replacement units will be wooden with uh, metal cladding and will match the glazing pattern of the existing windows uh, with Martin bars on the exterior of the glass, uh, which is consistent with the, uh, the HCD plan. Uh, so this, yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, particular attention uh, will need to be given to the six basement windows on the north elevation, which you can see in the plan here, um, which have for many years had infill replacement windows in them that uh, didn't fit the existing openings. When replaced, these windows need to fit within the existing openings and include arch tops. A condition of the approval has been included in this regard, and the applicants have agreed to amend their plans to include windows with arch tops, and this is the, the revised plan before you. Next slide, please. So the rear of the building, this section, uh, sorry, section 532 of the plan directs to, quote, not alter the size and shape of existing windows facing or visible the street uh, and not to create new openings uh, for windows and on facades visible from the street, unquote. The proposed infilling is located on the south, of course, which is out of view from the public, gives a little more flexibility to these changes. Uh, the applicants have noted that the infilling material will be limestone that matches uh, as close as possible uh, of the, uh, the stone of the building. Uh, the infill stone is to be recessed. Uh, they're suggesting approximately uh, seven and a half centimeters or three inches to visibly retain the location of the previous openings. The proposed new windows on the south elevation will be designed uh, to match uh, the, those throughout the building. Uh, being located on the secondary facade, um, which has had many changes uh, to this fenestration pattern, which is evident on the, the stonework on the rear. Uh, these new windows uh, will have little impact on the Heritage District, and we support it. So next slide, please. The scale uh, and location of the landscaping on the subject property was largely approved through the uh, 2019 application. However, for security and aesthetic uh, purposes, the owner is proposing to install a variety of lighting around the former school and along the access driveway, which you can see in the slide before you. Uh, initially, the applicants proposed lighting along the pathway uh, to the main front entrance, uh, which is actually on the plan, but is not uh, part of this application. Uh, they have removed this from their plans uh, following this discussion with the uh, city staff. Uh, the, and I have uh, added dots on this plan. I thought it would make it easier for, for everyone to, to see the lights proposed. Um, the exterior illumination of heritage buildings can actually be quite effective in showcasing its cultural heritage value. Uh, a condition of approval has been uh, included re uh, to require uh, heritage staff to review the building lighting performance uh, once installed to ensure there's no negative impacts uh, to the heritage attributes. Uh, and just uh, for everyone's benefit, so the red dots are the flush ground mounted uh, LEDs that will light up the front face of the building, uh, sort of wash the front face of the building. The green are the bollard style lights, uh, they're four feet high, um, that will uh, go along the the driveway um, access. And the blue is the one uh, wall pack, wall mounted light uh, that lights up that sort of inner courtyard for this uh, side entrance. So in summary, uh, the proposed alterations will improve the functionality and facilitate the adaptive reuse of this uh, property while not detracting from the heritage attributes or cultural heritage value of the district. Uh, in terms of our circulation uh, and comments received, uh, the building division notes that there is a active building permit application uh, for the proposed construction and renovation of the building. Uh, however, the applicants are advised that a, a building permit will still be required for the exterior stairs uh, and any structural changes to the, to the building. The environment team uh, has their standard comments regarding uh, the identification of potentially hazardous materials prior to construction. Uh, and in terms of circulation to this committee, the comments we received are included in your agenda package. Uh, staff note that the applicant is, that this application uh, is with regard to the proposed alterations of the historic limestone building only. Uh, it does not include the rear addition, which is previously approved, um, and, or the repairs to the original windows in the north uh, elevation of the building, which uh, will be subject to a separate application. 
So can I get the last slide, please? Uh, so staff recommend approval of this application, Mr. Chair. This is uh, the recommendation outlining the changes. Uh, the next two slides uh, are the associated 17 conditions uh, with this application, uh, which are before you today. Thank you very much. Good, thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, committee members, can you confirm that your uh, dash comments were correctly recorded? Let's do it the other way around. Any objections? Good. Okay. Members of the public making comments and questions. Do we have any yet? Don't believe we do. Mr. Chair, sorry, just before we move on, we do have um, the agents um, and the applicants here. Uh, I'm just going to ask them to turn their cameras on just in case they had anything further they wanted to add. It's very interesting. We don't actually have a spot for them in the procedures. There should be at some point when we review those, they should, there should be a special spot probably before members of the public for uh, the agents. Yeah, so Ray, whoever else wants to speak. Um, do I have to raise my hand, sorry? No, you're, <laughs> you're, the, you're good. <laughs> sorry, I can't see my face there. Um, uh, anyway, uh, yes, thanks for having us. We, um, we put an awful lot of uh, effort into this project and we're quite excited about it. Um, Peter Sarbri is the owner and he's uh, investing a substantial amount of money in the thing. Um, and, um, you know, as you mentioned, this is, um, I think there was some comments about, um, you know, why wasn't, weren't, weren't some of these, uh, you know, the emergency repairs, this sort of thing brought forward earlier in the application. I mean, the process here is that we, you know, we wanted to get an approval for the addition to the building. And as you mentioned, come back and get uh, to deal with the historic building uh, when the, you know, when we had enough time to kind of study the project and sort of you know, get our ducks in a row, if you will. So here we are today. Um, there was an emergency uh, repair that was cited on the building and that, uh, I don't know if everyone's clear on that, but we had, uh, there were two major bulges in the stonework on the building and they've been there for some time. And I don't know if they were, um, they were increasing in seriousness, but we, um, uh, you know, in order to move ahead with the thing in a in a uh, you know responsible manner, we had a structural engineer in looking at those, and uh, it was decided there was a need to replace a portion not only of the um, of the west wall of the building, but also the south wall of the building. If I have my directions correct, I, I'm assuming I'm I'm uh, basing my directions on Wellington Street being on the north of the building. Um, the south wall had a major bulge around the southeast corner. Uh, a significant portion of that building was bowing out and there was a serious one on the property line on the west side facing Queens. Uh, so that work, as you mentioned, is being undertaken. Um, the window openings are basically being uh, uh, replicated. You know, the, uh, the windows are being placed in the same locations they were. There are some alterations in the rear windows that are simply required to make the effective plans for the building work. And, and one thing I just want to mention is it's, you know, it's an, um, part of the interior design work, the strategy of this project was to make the entire building accessible. And we have done that now. Um, the main, I think the functional entrance to the building now is going to be on the east side of the building off of the laneway. Uh, you will have access to the to the door facing Wellington Street. And this is where we're replacing the steps to the building. Um, we are, um, and if you go to the building in the winter time and have a look below those steps, I think Ryan alluded, a lot of water and uh, debris gets through those steps and there is an entrance to the building at that level. So the concrete stairs were put in place as a, uh, as a means of um, eliminating some of those hazards. Also, they do give us a, um, you know, it's very sort of a long life element to the building, something that will resist salt and water. And um, we do have the added condition these days of providing tactile warning strips at the top and bottom of stairs. Very difficult to do in wood. Um, 
uh, then they, they do contribute to further deterioration. So the concrete we think works best there. Uh, that's the reason for that, uh, that alteration. We had a look at the windows of the building. Most of the, I think the windows that we're replacing on the um, three facades, generally, generally speaking, on the west, south, and east facades, with the majority of the window replacements. Uh, a lot of those windows, particularly on the east facade, were uh, vinyl windows. They weren't original. Uh, they were sort of poor replacements. Uh, a number of windows on the south facade were uh, replaced simply because of the, um, uh, they were replaced windows as well, but they were uh, uh, affected by that masonry removal as were the, uh, a number of windows on the, on the west facade of the building, the Queens facing facade. Um, the cresting of the building, uh, we had some discussions with the heritage staff about the cresting and we've, um, we had a, a more sort of abstract quest, uh, design for the cresting on the tower, which we kind of liked, but we've kind of relented and, uh, um, we are putting something there that uh, is more or less in line with one of those photographs. There, there have been a, a, uh, at least two versions of the cresting on that tower. Uh, the photograph, the archival photograph you saw in the images, we couldn't really determine what the actual uh, metalwork looked like on that, uh, that image. Yeah. Uh, the other one is closer and is a bit of a kind of an awkward uh, uh, intervention we think, but that's the one we basically, uh, we're basing our uh, revised design on. Um, I think we've, uh, there were some comments uh, from the committee about shingle colors. We agree, uh, you know, a three tab, a simple black shingle is more appropriate. We've, uh, we're going to do that. Um, I'll let Peter talk about the ground-based lighting. Um, and, um, in terms of the colors on the building, there's some uh, discussion about the appropriateness of using black or dark colors for window and door replacements. Uh, we've just recently, I mean, we like that approach. I know uh, there's differing opinions. It's really, we think perhaps a matter of taste more than anything, but uh, uh, we've just completed through this committee with this committee's help their renovations to the Frontenac Club on on um, King Street, and uh, that when that project is predominantly um, fit out with interventions that are in a black theme, contrasting against the uh, the kind of uh, light gray limestone we get here in the city, and we think that's a very effective way of doing these things. But uh, um, we'd also sort of turn your attention to uh, a building like the Gildersleeve House, which I think is a you know a beautiful restoration project here in Kingston, one of the most successful ones in the city, in my opinion. And it has a, it doesn't have black trim, it has very dark brown trim, but it's consistent color, it doesn't have, doesn't mix colors, um, you know, around the window jams, you know, intricate cutting in and that sort of thing isn't required. But we think that is an effective way to do it. And uh, anyway, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. If Peter wants to say anything, uh, uh, I know he's here. Yes, he is somewhere. Peter, do you have a comment? You might be muted. Yeah, hi. Hi there. Sorry about that. I'm uh, in oh, the wow. midst of a 14-day home isolation here due to a family contact. So balancing kids and whatnot in the background. Um, but anyways, um, further to Ray's point there, I think, uh, you know, the windows we've been the exterior colors in general, I think we've been batting around and um, I, I don't think we're comfortable with the final decision on the colors of the, the exterior windows. Um, so we, we plan to come back to the committee um, with the uh, review of the windows and doors anyways. Uh, so I thought it appropriate to just defer that decision about the colors of the windows and the detail to, to follow into that package. Um, but I think that's all I have to add, really. I, I don't think I have anything else outside of uh, those comments, but I'm here to answer any questions as they come. Okay, up. thank you very much. So we go on now to committee questions. Any questions that you have on this? Quite complicated, realize that. 
And I'm not seeing any movement anywhere. Oh, see how well you've done, uh, Ray and Peter. Oh, Jane, Jane, Jane. Not so fast. Ah, yes. Okay, that was a lot to take in, but thanks uh, to you both for providing all that information and clarification. Um, I, again, talking about the windows, I'm looking at that um, uh, picture of the, the windows that you want, the Norwood windows and their color selections. They've got some nice graphite slate, even the iron ore. So I would suggest that you might consider that, but I guess we're going to come back to that later. Um, I wanted to know uh, about the light gray. I have a question about the light gray for the concrete and whether you will have an opportunity to to kind of put a sample of that beside uh, the limestone um, that it's going to be integrated with. So that's my first question, I guess. Uh, can we answer? Yes, yes, please do. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, yeah, I, I mean, we, we will, uh, I think we could probably do that. We could, we could get a sample of the color that we have in mind there, Jane. We have, they, you know, they, coloring concrete is a, is a uh, is something we do commonly these days. Mm -hmm. So we probably might not be relying, you know, on a plain concrete. It's there's there's very very little cost to adding a little bit of, of color, but um, you know something that um, we we are sort of hoping to get. You know, my my philosophy when you're doing an exterior of a building is to try and limit. This is just again a matter of taste, but to try and limit the number of colors you use on the facade of a building. And if we could, um, if we could match the concrete to, you know, a, a kind of a mid tone of where the, uh, the existing stone is, uh, that's I think what we'd be attempting to do there. Great. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Good. Other um, questions? Yes, yeah, Jane. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm glad you're going to assess the uh, front door. That's great. Um, I mean, even if it is an original, it sure looks good there. So uh, that's super. Um, I wanted to just clarify. I think you said you were going to go with the three tab, not the Everest uh, shingles. Uh, as that's correct. Okay, great. Um, and my final question is about the building lighting. Mm -hmm. um, are they uh, just looking at, uh, I really appreciated that uh, diagram from Ryan with all of the dots on it because I could see where things were going. Are you considering for the one that's sort of the uh, power or the light pack that's on the building, will that be somehow shielded um, uh, for neighbors, um, and have you considered um, the ground, whether or not you need the ground mounted lighting? Um, and also, I know there's a lot of lighting around the side of the building, and I'm just wondering about uh, light bleed and impact on uh, neighboring pro uh, properties and what considerations you have there. I, I can jump in there, right? Um, so um, we have had a few discussions about lighting uh, and the impact, especially around neighboring properties. And that was reviewed um, by someone and I forget who reviewed it. Um, I, I think it might've been done through Pynchon, but I can't remember, but um, just to make sure that there was no light infiltration. Oh, sorry, that was Calidus, Calidus Engineering who would have done that to assess sort of the light um, pollution. Um, so according to their standards, and I'm not, certainly not the expert, but um, what's designed there is not to pollute onto neighboring properties. Um, in terms of the, the pathway lighting, uh, since the parking's at the rear and it's very dark back there, we do need that lighting on the pathway just because I think that's it's a safety issue essentially. Um, and then the other piece of lighting that we're talking about is the uh, lighting uh, that's sort of highlighting the, the front of the building. And I, th that is, um, I'm not sure the exact term, but it's, it's directed lighting. It's not supposed to be, um, you know, spreading a wide uh, range of light. It's, it's supposed to be a direct shot of light. So it, it is limited to uh, the exposure on the building and, and shouldn't affect um, buildings and neighbors in the area. Great. I think also the, the wall pack that light, there is a wall pack that lights the what is effectively the functional entrance to the building. If you lived in the building, you're probably going to come in through that side door. Yeah. Um, and that wall pack is down directed. It, it um, 
It doesn't have a lens that allows light to, um, to travel horizontally or upward. So uh, we could show you cuts of those if you want. Um, we'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you very much. Those are Good, thank you. Further questions? Final comments? Don. Uh, yes, I just want to say that I'm one of those that uh, don't th doesn't think uh, black is the right color. I agree. I admit that on a for a classical uh, design building, black may be okay, but not on a Victorian building. I can't imagine a Victorian style building like this uh, in in black. Uh, my suggestion would be dark green, but uh, I look forward to uh, hearing uh, uh, what your final proposals are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other last comments, Donald Mitchell? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, uh, and through you, I also wanted to just raise the, the, the window color just to uh, mention it. And also, if you look at uh, Wellington Street from Brock to Princess, you get some very good comparisons of light colored windows versus dark windows. And also uh, Sydenham Street between William and Johnson, you also get to literally stand and look at a comparison of the different windows. Um, I, I consider it an attribute. Um, I know that the staff report indicated that color is not something that's in the purview of the, the district plan, but it is really an attribute. And the windows, uh, when I looked at them, you really do lose some of the quality of the window, um, the darker the color goes and the, and the frame does really blend into the window pane itself. And it creates, uh, as you look at it, it does create a different relationship for the person who is looking at it. And then also in the context of all the other windows on the street. So I, I wanted to raise that. And in terms of lighting, we use ground lighting up the spire front of Sydenham Street United Church. Uh, we, we actually have it timed so it'll go off. So I had wondered about timing. And I also know that Queen's University on a number of buildings uses different intensity uh, at different times of the day. So I wanted to raise those. And the other final point is that the, uh, the bell tower light that we use actually is also used as wayfinding because we have such a large property. And so a little bit of bleed strategically actually does help light some of the elements uh, of the area and help people, the public navigate through the site. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Last comments? Seeing none then, I look for a mover of a motion which has 10 parts to it and 17 conditions and it's unamendable. Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by. Donald Mitchell, thank you very much. Any further comments? You've had your say, you know we're coming back. This gets the next step on. In that case, I'll call the vote. Those in favor and those opposed. And that carries and thank you, the two of you for coming. And we look forward probably to seeing you yet again. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ray and Peter. That moves us on to 40 Lower Union Street. Hello, Mr. Chair, that's, that's me presenting. Oh, Hi. Welcome. Hey, I'll just wait for this slide to come up. Here we are. So we're looking at 40 Lower Union Street, which is a part five designation. Um, we have an application for alteration under section 42 of the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, which has been submitted to request approval to replace an existing rear deck within an enclosed porch addition. Next slide, please. So the subject property is located at 40 Lower Union Street. So on the southwest side of Lower Union Street, just south of King Street East. Next slide. The property contains a two-story brick row house, which was constructed sometime between 1865 and 1875. Next slide. So the property is designated under part five of the act um, in, tw in 2015 through 
bylaw number 2015-67, so part of the old Sydenham Heritage Conservation District. The property inventory sheets note that this property is significant to the district, and the form describes the building as a more elaborate version of the mid-19th century row houses which they abut and with which they are flush and step back. Next slide, please. So here's, a, here's an image of the existing rear deck that is proposed to be removed and replaced with the enclosed porch addition. Next slide, please. So as proposed, the new porch addition complies with the policies that are set out in section 5.2.2 and section 5.4 of the old Sydney HCD plan. The enclosed porch addition will be located at the rear or west elevation of the house. And at just under 14 feet at its highest point, the enclosed porch will be clearly secondary in terms of size to the house. The enclosed porch is proposed to be clad in board and batten wood siding to match the existing board and batten that currently clads the carriage way infill that you see to the right of that image um, of the porch. And the proposed windows and doors are uh, wooden storm windows with divided lights as well as a wooden storm door. The proposed monopitch roof is a dark gray metal roof. And the pal this palette of materials and wood detailing will provide a distinguishable but complementary contrast from the main house with its red brick exterior walls. The proposed porch addition will conceal um, the rear entrance door with a brick jack arch. However, this entrance is not currently visible from the pub public realm, it is quite hidden. Um, the metal roof flashing will, will be tucked into a mortar joint, which will need to be raked out to three quarter inch deep to accommodate this flashing. But again, we, we would view this as a reversible alteration to the heritage building. It's, um, certainly if this porch were ever removed in the future, you could repair um, this and repoint this joint. Next slide, please. So this, these are a couple photos that I took from Ontario Street. So you're sort of looking uh, somewhat north, a little bit north uh, east from Ontario Street. Um, and what they're intended to show is just simply the fact that this this portion of 40 Lower Union Street is virtually impossible to see uh, from the public realm. So you'll see that tree, you see that red sort of rear um, screened in deck and the proposed porch and, and the existing deck are on the other side of that tree and red porch that you see in, in the foreground. Um, so certainly looking north from Ontario Street, the replacement porch with the walls and the roof and the minimally enlarged floor area would be very minimally visible. And as a result, the impact of this port addition to the character of the old Sydney uh, Heritage Conservation District will be negligible. So as a result, staff are of the, opinion, of the opinion that this proposal will uphold the heritage conservation objectives we have set out in our official plan, as well as the eight guiding principles from the ministry, as well as um, the Parks Canada standards and guidelines. So in terms of comments from Heritage Kingston members, we largely, there were no concerns with this proposal. We had one member who just asked for clarification on its visibility and so I'm hoping that these um, photographs help to clear up that question. In terms of planning comments, um, this property does have a site specific zoning in the B zone and as a result this this porch does require minor variance um, for it to be able to move forward. Uh, if we move to the next slide please, there is a recommendation before you um, which includes uh, seven uh, conditions of the approval. Thank you very much. Good, thank you very much, Alex. Uh, members of the committee, can you confirm your dash comments have been correctly recorded? Good, thank you very much. Um, do we have the owners or agents here, Alex, to make any comments, Elizabeth? Yes, yeah, I believe Todd Biggerman is oh, here Todd, today. Oh, Todd, yes. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Todd? Okay. You're muted, but I, been, I saw the head shake. Uh, Alex, thank you for the job. Uh, um, members of the public, I don't believe we yet have any, so we can probably, unless I'm missing, pass You're that correct, one. Mr. Chair. I, there are no other members of the public. There are no other members. Thank you very much. Uh, committee members, comments, questions? And seeing none, Sorry, Mr. Chair, oh, Ms. Uh, McFarland. Jane, final comments then, yeah. Uh, I don't know what's happening with the hand function, but <laughs> um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say that these are great plans, really detailed and really appreciated the photos, et cetera. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Others? 
And seeing none then, uh, looking for a motion to move and a seconder. Uh, no alterations, of course, to the motion allowed. Paul Bamfield moving, Donald Mitchell seconding. You have one um, motion, uh, one uh, statement and seven, the usual seven um, uh, conditions there. Uh, any further last comments? And seeing none, those in favor of the motion as printed in your package, those opposed, thank you very much. Thank so you. that is approved and we'll go on to council. That, I believe, takes us on to uh, the working group reports. Um, the only comment I'm going to make on these is a um, clarification I got from Andrea yesterday that in the November and December ones, it notes that the September one needs to be revised. And in the, the version that you have got, the September one is revised. So you've got three um, sets of minutes there, or sets of minute of meeting notes, which are correct and um, uh, are what the committee wanted. If you've got questions, they should go to, I guess, to Andrea or to the uh, the, the committee at a later point. But they're certainly for your uh, for your information. Uh, emergency approval. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mr. Chair. Before we move on, I wasn't sure if uh, staff wanted to give the committee an update on uh, what was contained in the notes for the working group. Uh, I just thought we should check in with staff just in case they had any additional comments they wanted to provide. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I would just like to mention basically where we are in the process. Um, so at this time, we're, we're, we've We've gathered a lot of data and information, including mostly survey results from, from past applicants, um, members of the community, that kind of thing. Um, so right now we're in the, the process of compi compiling all of the, the feedback that we've gotten. Um, and at our next meeting, we're going to be looking at some of the themes that have come across because we do see actually a lot of um, repeat comments from people. Like we're seeing some pretty clear themes coming through, um, which is great. And I just wanted to ask um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Campbell, if she had anything to add. Sorry, thank you um, and through you, Mr. Chair. No, I, I don't really think I have anything to add at this point. Um, I think if anyone has questions or comments they wanna share about the work that's underway um, or, or want to connect uh, around the themes that are emerging, we're certainly happy to, to take those offline um, in whatever way that suits. Um, the next meeting, uh, and I'm pulling this from my memory, I believe is on Wednesday, Andrea, maybe if you could confirm of next week. Um, as I mentioned Correct. earlier with the McDonald Working Group, uh, meetings are open to the public. Uh, so if anyone were interested in attending to kind of learn more about the themes and where we're at, um, they're certainly welcome to do so. And if you have trouble locating that information about how to join, you can reach out to myself or Andrea and we can get that ready for you. Thank you. Good, thank you both of you. Any comments, questions? Seeing none then, I'll move on to emergency approvals, Ryan. Uh, none this month, Mr. Chair. Okay, moving on to motions. You have a motion there moved by Don Taylor, seconded by Jane McFarlane, which hopefully you've read, which ends up Therefore, be it resolved that Heritage Kingston requests City Council to reconsider the recently imposed application fee for heritage alteration permits. Don, do you want to talk through that? And there is an addendum, by the way, with a number of supporting letters. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, if you've read the addenda, you'll see there's a lot of quite strong comments from uh, the heritage community, you might say. Uh, I guess the main point is that owners of designated heritage properties already face significant costs to uh, maintain and uh, uh, renovate their, their properties by uh, provincial and municipal legislation and putting a, an additional fee uh, on top of them really seems inappropriate. So I won't go into uh, uh, the details that you can read in those comments, but uh, just a few words about the, the broader picture. Uh, in Kingston, there are, there are many people who appreciate living in heritage properties and they're comfortable with 
applying for permits and consulting heritage staff and, and the committee for advice and approvals. However, there are many others uh, who have no interest in heritage, don't want their properties designated, and are reluctant to be told how to repair their porch or to be told they can't uh, replace their windows and so forth. Uh, in many cases, the result is uh, repairs are done without a permit uh, or simply neglected. And uh, uh, so we lose a lot of important heritage uh, attributes. The city should be trying to encourage good stewardship of heritage properties. Imposing a heritage fee, I think, will have the opposite effect. <clears throat> So this motion is to ask council to reconsider their decision to impose this fee. Uh, if the committee approves, I hope the councillors on this committee will take our message to council and explain our, our arguments. Ideally, when the fee schedule came to council in December, the proposed heritage fee would have been discussed and perhaps some councillors would have noticed uh, its impact on heritage property owners and suggested that Heritage Kingston should be consulted. Instead, what happened apparently was that the heritage fee was deeply buried in a long appendix and nobody noticed. Uh, it was approved in December. Then there were Heritage Kingston meetings in January and February, but no one mentioned the new fee. I finally heard about it, but an applicant was surprised uh, by getting this fee and asked me, how did we let this happen? Well, I think we now have uh, an opportunity to make a statement. Unfortunately, there's a, a history of the administration getting major changes to heritage procedures through council without anyone noticing and with no consultation with any stakeholders. This should be unacceptable. And I think today we should send a strong message to council asking them to reconsider uh, the, the heritage permit fee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane, do you want to add to that? Second up. Yes, uh, I really would like to reiterate everything that Dawn said. Um, I think it's a disincentive for uh, heritage property owners to apply for a permit and to gain the expertise that uh, and benefit from uh, the staff and Heritage Kingston. And um, I also think that owning a heritage property uh, is an expensive proposition as it is. Um, and so this extra fee is just another disincentive to uh, buy and maintain and to properly um, restore if need be. Uh, I also think it's counterintuitive to um, achieving the goal of section 7.0 of the city of Kingston's official plan, conserve and enhance built heritage resources within the city so that they may be accessed, experienced and appreciated by all residents and visitors and retained in an appropriate manner and setting as a value, valued public trust held for future generations. I, I do not support having a $300 fee uh, for uh, heritage permits. Thanks. Thank you very much. Others wish to speak on this? Uh, Councillor Doherty. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I totally hear what you're saying. And I think, Don, you explained it really well. And I agree um, that it is a dis dis um, disincentive. It, this is a very, very difficult one because the aim was for the city to also raise funds to hire a heritage planner. And that would actually help heritage, uh, the heritage committee and, and the aim to protect the heritage properties. Um, we're struggling with funds. That's, there's, you know, every municipality with COVID uh, is struggling with funds. And so the aim, but, but we also are committed to protecting heritage properties and the aim was to actually really channel this money towards a heritage planner. Uh, but I hear what you're saying and I actually 
agree with it. I think I think the consequence of it will be that it'll be sort of as a disadvantage. But I do want to say, Don, um, or oh, Mr. Taylor, according uh, like in response to your comment that the sh city should encourage people to to you know take responsible ownership and, and stewardship of their heritage buildings. It is. The city can only do what the city can, as in it's, we are limited, like sometimes property owners, as you know, they just go along and, and do things before anybody is aware that their work has actually taken place. I do think this additional fee will perhaps encourage more of that kind of just to do it and ask questions later kind of behavior. But for me, I really, it's hard, I have to make a decision, but uh, I, I'm really sitting on the fence here because I understand both aims, and um, uh, so I'm just going to just wanted to say the city's side of things is I think it's an it's a, um, a very good aim that reason why this was introduced, uh, and I appreciate the other comments and in I'll listen to what other people have to say. Uh, and maybe I'd like to also hear from staff's point of view what, the, what their thoughts are. And in the meantime, we'll have to try to make a decision, but it's a difficult one because we do. it would be great to have a, another heritage planner, like a proper heritage planner to help us make these decisions. Uh, but, but at the same time, we don't want the disincentive. Thanks. Good, thank you. I'm gonna to go to staff in just a moment, but Paul Banfield, you had a hand up first. Uh, yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, really, I think uh, Councillor Doherty has, has answered um, my question, which was what was the uh, the uh, city's um, explanation as to why this three hundred dollar fee was um, suddenly imposed, and also to to uh, thank Mr. Taylor for um, assuring me that I wasn't the only one uh, that had no idea what the heck was going on with this, um, that it, it sounds like it had been, yeah, uh, very much sprung. So thank you to the two of you. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Thank you through you, Mr. Chair. I did. I did want to speak to this, and I think I think the comments that have been raised so far very much reflect the discussions that we've had as staff. Um, we completely understand the concerns around potentially, you know, providing a disincentive to apply for permits, which is the last thing we want to do. Um, we are hopeful that because the fee is low, it truly is a nominal fee. So I would I would say that that it, that is true in two ways. Um, one is that it does not reflect the true the true amount of staff time that we spend on these permits, which which for years has been covered entirely by the tax pace. So there have been no user fees in the city since the former city of Kingston, since amalgamation. As far as I know, there haven't been any fees. Um, so even at three hundred dollars, this process continues to be heavily subsidized by the tax base. Um, the other piece that I would mention is that generally speaking, when municipalities use user fees, they, they also include an opportunity to apply for a waiver to those fees through council. And the purpose of that waiver is, is for inability to pay. So that, that is an option for applicants. I would note based on kind of my awareness of, of heritage applications and certainly through our grant program where we, we see like actual receipts for the work that people have done. Um, $300 is truly nominal as well in terms of the project costs of most of the permits that we're looking at. So the amount that applicants are spending on um, consultants and materials and design is, is really far higher than that $300 fee. Um, so as Councillor Doherty mentioned, this, this is an attempt to have a little bit of revenue coming in for the, the department so that we can hire more staff and do more heritage work generally. That includes responding to your development applications, but it also includes doing that proactive policy work to create designations and heritage conservation districts. Um, I think a really positive change that that our, our group has just made is to, to put me into a full-time position as manager of heritage. Before I was really trying to um, handle this portfolio along with the general policy planning portfolio, which was a lot. Um, so this enables me to be able to really devote um, my resources and certainly, you know, through Ryan and Alex as well to continue to devote basically three full time staff um, at this point to heritage and then with the the additional user fees that we've introduced it allows us to add a second position 
um, for the latter half of 2021, or sorry, a fourth position. So four, four overall, um, which would be excellent because I think we can get a lot more work done. Um, one last note I just wanted to make on user fees in general with municipalities. There is a, a sort of a, a philosophy behind it, which says that you know when a uh, service is provided by the municipality that benefits individuals, those individuals should pay some, some or all of the cost of that service. Um, and in planning, for example, it's cost recovery. So, so people are required to pay a fee that is intended to cover the full cost of the staff time to process the application, including other costs. For Heritage, what we're looking at now is doing a combination. So having some user fees apply, but also having those be heavily subsidized really by the, the tax base because there is a public benefit as well to heritage conservation. Um, what I'm really interested in is the committee's thoughts on what proportion in, um, benefits the individual versus what proportion benefits the community as a whole. Because I think, I think it's something that, that is really interesting to question. Um, and so what we'll be doing is we'll be bringing a report to the, to the committee um, very shortly to discuss the fees question in, in general, and also to lay out um, a consultation program for you to give us input on, on how, if, if council decides that we should continue with some user fees for heritage permits, um, how that might be broken down. Because as many of, of the respondents have mentioned, a flat fee doesn't make a ton of sense for these types of permits when some are so simple and some are so complex. Um, so one of the things that we really would like to look at is what the city of Ottawa has just done this year, which is a, a graduated fee schedule based on the type of permit being applied for. Um, and ideally, I would love to have that linked to the types of permits that we see through our delegated authority guidance. So I think, I think there's really a conversation that we can have this year to look at this and make sure that we're keeping costs low for applicants um, while also hopefully providing additional resources to the department because it will enable us to invest those nominal user fees into additional heritage conservation work citywide. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Good, thank you, Jennifer Campbell. Hi, and thank you, um, and through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to echo much of what Andrea has already shared, but also just offering the, to the committee um, to think about as well in, in this consideration, those heritage grants that were mentioned by Andrea, because I think there is also obvious commitment on the part of council and through those heritage grants to property owners to provide incentives to do work on properties. So in addition to the opportunity for council uh, to waive fees, which also opens a discussion about consistency and fairness in fee waivers. Um, you know, so council needs to know how they're approaching that decision so that the community receives it in, in that mention of fairness and equitability. Uh, but also then the opportunity for property owners who may see this financial barrier to be able to explore property grant applications to offset not only the cost of the fee, but the cost of the totality of the repair to their property. Um, so I think there is a balance that needs to be struck here. And I just, you know, think that the, the committee in considering this, as, as Andrea has noted, um, you know, there is no tax base revenue that, that comes into the planning department to support this work. And fee for service is a familiar model in municipalities. Um, and so I think we're, we're trying to strike and, and the planning group is trying to strike a, a really important balance here. And it is not going to be, you know, we would love to always provide service that um, has no fees associated with uh, but the financial constraints and the realities, even of the most recent COVID-19 impacts on the global municipal budget are requiring us all to be thinking um, a little differently about fee structures. And I think also just reminding the committee as Andrea closed with, there is an opportunity here that um, this council approved fee structure at, is rolling out, but that also requires then an examination of, of its rollout and a, a right sizing of the model moving forward. And I think Andrea covered that when she was mentioning uh, the opportunity to scale or right size the fees based on the kinds of applications, the intent of the property, um, the future zoning implications, housing, et cetera. So I think it is the beginning of a, of a necessary and what will become a deeper conversation about next steps. Um, but that's, that's just a little bit more in support of how that grant program, I really think has to also remain in your minds when you're thinking about this, 
because we are showing through the municipal um, granting commitment to trying to offset the expenses that property owners are having. So thank you. Thank you very much. Jane, you have a hand up. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to clarify uh, or to help someone to help me understand if you live in a part five in a heritage conservation district, if you apply, uh, does everyone in that heritage conservation district uh, who need, who's going to make an alteration uh, need to apply then pay the $300 fee? Who wants to try that one, Andrea? Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. So, so if the work that, that is proposed is covered by the HCD plan and specifically requires a permit, then yes. Okay, and my next question is then anything that goes to delegated authority would also require the $300 fee, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. At, at this so, point, it, it is very much a flat fee that applies to all permit applications. Right. So basically, anybody who lives in an HCD is probably going to have to uh, pay the $300 for alterations or additions or whatever else. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Further questions? Donald Mitchell? I don't have question per se, but I have comment. Is this the appropriate moment for that? Yep. Okay, uh, th then thank you, Mr. Chair, um, through you. Um, so first I wanted to thank uh, Don Taylor and Jane McFarland because um, I actually heard about this through the Sydenham District Association when a member emailed me about this. So it was a surprise also for me. And, and I feel like it's a service to the committee and council that we actually delve into this a little bit. So I, I wanted to touch on some, some general um, uh, comments. So. Um, this touches very close to home with what we do too, that when the pandemic hit, uh, we, we took six months of our tenants and our costs and everything and just said, don't worry about it. Let's see where we are in the fall. And I'm sure the municipality has made all kinds of cuts and changes too. And so I wanted to raise, and I think it's important to raise, um, the consideration of staff and all of us who are working at home. We have kids, decisions have to be made. And I think there are a number of things that have unfolded since the pandemic hit that have not been optimum. Um, and I don't think this decision was optimum in the way that it unfolded, but I have huge uh, sympathy for it. And I don't think, and it's already been raised by a few people, including staff, I don't know that this is necessarily the forum to get into all the minutia of what we could do and couldn't do. But I wanted to raise that we have a public engagement framework. And at some point in time in using that framework, there is a there is a way to hierarchy these decisions and what type of public process it needs. And I think this was a public process that needed to go to property owners, it needed to go to the committee and it needed to go to the public in a much wider fashion than it sounds like it, it did. But I'm also very sympathetic to the climate. And this is probably the third major change that occurred that there was strong public reaction to. Um, in all of the comments from various people, I want, I want to touch on the, the scale of things. So when you look at institutions and you look at um, the National Heritage Site Cemetery and you look at how uh, someone can put towers up right along the side of that cemetery that may or may not compromise the heritage attributes of that property and then they profit because of that wonderful view. Um, you know, uh, people are taking drones around town and they take pictures of all of our buildings that we spend great deal of money to maintain. And that's a way to make money off of uh, a heritage property and it's not and it's not captured. But yet those heritage properties, for example, uh, Sidham Street United Church has put a million dollars into their building since 2017. They uh, will put 300,000 into their building this year. And these are, these are huge amounts of money that they're doing. And some of these buildings are owned by service organizations. You know, so they turn around then in turn and are offering money and offering services to other people often at no cost. So on that level, I think it's really important. I had two owners of heritage properties contact me who were very concerned about this. And I also had two owners of rental properties in the Heritage District, which is also worth noting because they're the ones who have to often do renovations to their properties and they add to them. And I think that's really important. 
Uh, and then of course the tenants that are there and the way that this all trickles down. So I, I have a lot of concern for this. None of the Sydenham District Association board, I had to abstain from all of the conversation on this, but none of them would support this. I suspect a huge uh, proportion or almost all of the membership wouldn't support it. And the final thing I guess that I would say is just that I do think there's a huge opportunity for middle ground here. So I don't think this is entirely about a let's reconsider no fee. I think there are different types of things that are being done. If you're repairing your roof and it's going to cost you $250,000, you know, that's a very different conversation than I'm taking a heritage building and I'm going to add, uh, you know, four bedrooms to it uh, and create more rental opportunity. And one to me is very much a development project. And the other one is very much we're trying to, as best we can on limited funds, maintain our properties. So those would be my comments. So I, I support this, but I, I believe similar to what staff has said that there's a bigger conversation that has to be had. And uh, I have a lot of sympathy for decisions that have to be made and made in a different fashion than maybe the public are hoping for because of everything that's going on. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Other comments? Council Doherty? Well, I have, I have a question for staff. Um, how can we move forward? Because uh, uh, a lot of good points were raised that uh, like a $300 flat fee is uh, probably not the way to go. Um, and uh, we probably should have, no, no doubt, uh, some public engagement on this and further discussion. So I guess I have more of a process question since this has already gone through council. Um, uh, what, what kind of process can you can you envision? What kind of solutions, perhaps? Andrea? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. So um, if this motion continues to council, then there will be a debate on the council floor about it. Um, council could decide to, you know, make a decision either way. I think it might require a reconsider based on the previous decision of council, um, but that's something that, that clerks will certainly help us um, to sort out. What I'm recommending to, to the committee is to allow us to continue to collect this fee for 2021 so that we can continue to hire this new planner that we'd like to bring on board. Um, I just wanna be clear about something. If the fee is canceled, we cannot bring that additional position on board. Um, and I would, I would love to then have that conversation with the committee to, to come up with a fee schedule that, that feels appropriate and will, will kind of strike that balance and allow us to um, you know, continue to heavily subsidize all of this programming, but also allow us to have a little bit of revenue to, to help again, invest into the program overall. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, just have a follow-up question. Yep. And so Andrea, how do we ensure that that conversation will definitely happen if we don't support this? motion in front of us, but that we have assurance that those other conversations definitely will happen. Certainly, that's a great question. Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, the good news is I've already started the report that I will be bringing to HK to discuss this. Um, so so what, will, what, what I'm planning is a, a full staff report, just like a normal um, piece of business that will then give us the ability to have a bit more of an in-depth um, discussion and consultation um, on moving forward because I, I do think that this is an important um, piece to discuss and I think some of some of the inherent interests involved in it I think make it a little bit tricky. So the, the people that would be required to pay the user fee are very much against it. Um, but I think we need to be able to remember that we, we are trying to look at what's best for, um, you know, the, the community overall. And we're trying to not get too wrapped up in, in those individual requests that are based on individual interests. I think, I think that's an important piece of this that we need to be talking about. Um, because there is some individual benefit for people who, who use these programs. I'm going to really put an awkward question to you and I guess it's to Elizabeth. Disclosure of pecuniary interests. Can, should owners of designated properties be voting on this motion? 
Mr. Chair, with regards to disclosure of pecuniary interest, that is up to each individual member and yeah. it is not something that we can provide comment on. Should a member feel that they have a vested interest, uh, they can uh, disclose that interest prior to the vote um, and they can turn their cameras off. However, that is up to the individuals, uh, the individual members to determine. Okay, thank you very much. Further comments on this? And seeing none then, the motion has not been changed at all. So it's basically be it resolved that Heritage Kingston requests City Council to reconsider the recently imposed application fee for heritage alteration permits. Sorry, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Taylor does have his hand raised. Mr. Taylor. Uh, yes, I would like uh, to make a little bit of comment. Uh, uh, I agree it's a, a, a difficult uh, situation, um, but I'm, uh, well, I think everyone agrees that the flat fee that has now been imposed is not the way to go. Uh, there should be a better mechanism. Um, uh, to my knowledge, Andrea has mentioned only one other municipality that has introduced a heritage uh, permit fee, and that uh, starts at zero for, for some applications. So at the very least, we should be looking to see what other municipalities are doing and consider some flexibility in the kinds of fees that we're going to put in place. We already heard from uh, uh, Mark Letourneau this morning about his dismay at his uh, um, uh, applicant having to pay not one but two fees for their work on Otterburn. The reality is that many, many heritage properties uh, and property owners don't really have a lot of cash to uh, to spare. And you know, maybe maybe three hundred dollars is not a large component of that, but it can make the difference. It makes some difference. Uh, and it certainly is a disincentive uh, to put things off and uh, not to do what's right. And uh, another couple of points, I think putting this a fee of $300 on will not pay for another heritage plan, nowhere near. Uh, so it's, you know, this whole budget business, you know, it's complicated. I appreciate the city is under a lot of stress with the pandemic and so on. But uh, that shouldn't, I don't think this is the way to deal with that. So uh, I hope that even if you don't, uh, even if you think that some fee is appropriate, that you will still support a motion to reconsider. And hopefully there will be some discussion with stakeholders uh, as for a, a better uh, plan for uh, an, an application fee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that should close debate as it was the mover making the last. Jane, that move closes debate as the mover made. So the motion is as printed. Um, and as Don pointed out, it says reconsider, which could lead, as Andrea commented, to almost anything. Those in favor of the motion as printed. Those opposed to the motion as printed. That carries six to two. Notices of motion. Correspondence, you will notice there is material from the Ontario Heritage Trust. In fact, there are two pieces from the Ontario Heritage Trust and there are the letters um, basically on the, uh, the fee, uh, both in your package and which came uh, um, in the addendum. The next meeting, April the 21st. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Jane and Donald Mitchell. Thank you all very, very much. Just, just over three and a half hours. That was a long one. Two and a half hours. Thank you very much indeed. Take care.